Yeah, so vaccine supply. Uh, so, so first, so now we spoke about how we develop a vaccine. Now let's see how we can actually make one. Uh, the, the technologies we spoke about are, uh, you know, that's like developing the, the technology is one thing. You know, getting it going in the lab and making your vaccine candidate, that's one thing. But making it robust enough and reproducible enough to actually be able to upscale it to industry size, that is another. So here you're not dealing with uh, excited scientists uh, that are, you know, uh, happy to tweak it out and, you know, play with it until they get it right. Here you have to have uh, a process that is robust enough that can uh, work you know, in a condition where you have uh, technicians serving it and they follow, you know, step one, uh, you know, step two, you know, without actually experimenting anymore. So this is, this is the real challenge. Uh, so now you know that vaccines are biological mixtures of different components. So it's actually, uh, it's several different things together, right? So it's, uh, you have the antigen, but you might have the conjugate, uh, vaccine with the carrier protein and you can have the adjuvant as well and uh, it is in sharp contrast actually uh, with the classical non-biological drug like paracetamol for example where you have well-defined single chemical entity that you can produce uh, you know just the entity and that's pretty much it then you you know you you formulate it into a tablet and you're done so vaccines are heterogeneous biological products and you actually use uh, living biological matter to produce that. So there is some uh, variation in the concentration and the yield, you know, I mean, who, who works with cell cultures or, or bacterial cultures, you know, that there are things that are so esoteric that sometimes it grows, sometimes it doesn't, you know, you can't really tell why. Well, it is a little bit like that. Obviously, in the industry setting, there are very strict quality control steps, and it's standardized to ensure that this doesn't happen. But still, the vari variation is still there, and you have to deal with it. And so the difference between the non-biological non drugs and vaccines goes actually much further. So besides the competition, uh, uh, composition, it's also the uh, trials that lead to the development of the vaccines that are typically much larger uh, because you're dealing with disease prevention. So it's actually different in the, in the requirements, statistical requirements on the vaccine design than trials that are actually dealing with treatment of a condition. The regulatory approval uh, of vaccine is also quite complex. It's the, it takes typically longer to get a vaccine through the regulatory approvals uh, as compared to a typical uh, drug. The supply is also co more complex because you have to have cold chain. And uh, this is also not something that you would see with the, with the standard drugs. You have a controlled temperature uh, condition rather. Uh, and the time to market from production to supply. So that also is uh, different. The, the lead time for vaccines is much longer than uh, non-biological drugs. You actually have to think much more ahead and plan much more ahead with vaccine production. And the administration, so obviously vaccine you inject a couple of times. Uh, the drug you use once or you use it as long, typically, as long as the condition uh, endures. So one big topic or one big theme of uh, vaccine production is that is manufactured in bulk. So you have different steps and each of the steps of the production you produce a bulk of intermediate <coughs> product. So at the very beginning, depending on, of, on which of those vaccines designs that we spoke about before you use, you will be dealing either with the cell culture or, or bacteria culture to produce your whole uh, pathogen, or you might have those expression systems to produce the fancier new technology vaccines. And uh, then you, you, you complete your, your production and you actually uh, isolate your whole pathogens or those subunits or split antigens or recombinant proteins and so you purify them, you sterile filter them, uh, all of that has to be aseptic. I don't know if you have ever seen a worker in a, probably not, in a vaccine production line. I feel sorry for them because they have to really 
uh, dress, you know, overtake the, uh, the suits. Uh, I mean, it, it takes a really long time, you know, to, to just get ready and aseptic to enter the room. It's extremely tightly controlled. So, I mean, thinking of going to toilet, of course, I mean, this is the thing that you have to sort of first before you go uh, to your shift. And then uh, there is a batch release. So this is actually one big theme of vaccine manufacturing, is the quality control at each of the steps. And it's because you're dealing with living matter, with biological compounds, so it has this intrinsic variability, and you have to, you have, to have very tight control on that to be sure that you're obviously compliant with the regulations, but mainly you produce safe and effective vaccine. The next steps, they, pr they involve formulation, filling, and packaging. So you take your uh, antigen containing product, uh, whatever its nature is, you add adjuvants, maybe, stabilizers, maybe, and then you will put it into a syringe or a tube or a vial. And already at this stage, you have to think a little bit where the vaccine will go, because different markets have different preferences. You know, some will use multi-dose vials, like the uh, WHO, uh, Gavi countries. Some of them will prefer uh, pre-filled syringes, so typically Western countries, uh, where you deal with individual patients. And so you have to know roughly how much of which do you need. And then you go for labeling and packaging. And so labeling and packaging, that is already very country specific. So there you actually have to know for sure how many vaccines you want to ship where, because there are regulations, obviously the language, but many more, much more than that. You actually have uh, legal requirements on what needs to be on the label, how it needs to be labeled, how it needs to be packaged. So at this step, you're already committing certain number of vaccines for a particular area. And changing your mind is possible, but it might not do a lot, actually. So uh, uh, there are situations where you can reallocate vaccine if there is epidemic. It's exception, it's not a rule. So as I spoke about the quality processes, so uh, each step of the manufacturing has its own quality control. Uh, at the end of it, you produce your batch or a lot uh, and then you have the quality assurance step where you ensure that you have complied to good manufacturing practices, you review your batch records, and then you have the quality control step where you do independent lab test of the final vaccine, make sure it matches the pre-specified criteria, and you will issue certificate of analysis. And so if all of that is fine, you will declare the batch to be released. And so this is on the manufacturer side. But then you manufacture the vaccine in a certain country in Europe, typically, I mean, we are in Belgium. And so we have to actually comply with the EMA, uh, European Medicines Agency regulations, uh, where the country where you produce the vaccines actually acts as the supervising state. And they actually review, retest, and do their own release on top of ours before we get out of Belgium. And then you, as you're arriving to the countries of destination, the local regulatory authorities will then do the same thing, basically. They will retest, review, and do their own release. So you can imagine that a, co a company that supplies vaccines to the whole world uh, will have to comply with many different local regulations at the same time. And uh, this puts a considerable strain on the company because uh, you are complying with the FDA rules, with the EMA rules, with the different national regulatory authorities rules. You actually have to be able to accommodate WHO, which acts as an agency for UNICEF and uh, UN uh, established uh, entities to ensure the quality of the vaccines that they are uh, uh, asking from us. And then also you have the internal audits by our own quality assurance. So actually, in our building, there is every week there is an inspection of some sort. So it's not a question of if that happens, it just happens. It's a rolling cycle of in, in inspections. So that's, that's actually quite, uh, quite heavy. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a, a, a whole picture on, on a single slide, uh, I will show you how long it actually takes to produ produce the vaccine from the very beginning until the actual distribution to the patients. 
So you will start with your R&D. This will take about <coughs> maybe 10 years, maybe 30 years. And then you will submit your dossier to the regulatory agency. You will get your approval and you have your day zero. So you will come in the morning to the factory, you switch on the lights. And the first thing you have to do is actually get the raw materials in. So the materials you need to start producing the vaccine. So you have to do the QC and, and ensure everything is fine. This takes typically two weeks. Then you will start your bulk manufacturing. So this is where, you know, what we spoke about before, you know, your fermentation, cell lines, what have you. And then if you have those subunit vaccines, the maturation on top of that. So this might take between 10 and 12 months. And here, this is extremely variable number. So I have taken one that is typical for the most used vaccines. But if, for example, flu vaccine is much faster to produce. It's been designed that way because we are responding to uh, epidemic. So there are vaccines that are different in the, uh, in the duration in, of indi individual steps. But 10 to 12 months is a good illustration for some of the combination vaccines that uh, are most commonly used. The next step is the coupling, filling, and formulation. So coupling, if it's a conjugate vaccine, filling formulation, quality control, this is what we just spoke about. This might take about six to 10 months. And it's actually the quality control that takes the longest. The filling formulation, this really takes, you know, day, couple of days. Uh, but it's the quality control because you use living uh, infection model. You use mice, which you infect, with, uh, infect inject with your vaccine and then you wait for the immune response to come, and this is what takes all the time. And finally, it's the lot of release packaging and shipment, so some six to 18 weeks. So if you take it all together, it takes about 18 to 26 months to produce a single vaccine. So the vaccine you're holding today, the production started like two years ago. So throughout the whole manufacturing process, uh, there is uh, a very tight quality control and assurance. This actually takes 70% of the production time. And at the same time, there is patient safety and pharmacovigilance uh, uh, process. So this is actually something that allows us to um, actively monitor for safety signals uh, in the field after a release of a vaccine for use. And if there are some signals that would indicate, let's say, higher local reactogenicity, we are capable of looking back into the manufacturing data to see whether we could associate it with some variations that would be still within specifications, but could give us some hints on whether this could be associated with manufacturing or something else. So the little magnifying glass is a quality control step. So there are testing done by the manufacturer uh, within those individual uh, uh, production steps. On top of that, the testing done by the exporting country, so the supervising state, so to speak. So those are at the end, so it's the formulation uh, step, the quality control, and then the lot release itself. And then on, on top of that, you have the testing done by the importing country. So it's somehow repetition uh, in most cases of what has been done uh, at the lot release stage uh, at the manufacturer. And it's from the time of filling and formulation where you actually have to start thinking about the cold chain. So this is where actually the shelf life of the vaccine starts ticking. So the faster you get through the whole process, the more shelf life is left to the customer. So it's a race against time somehow. So the journey of a vaccine from production to distribution is complex for many reasons. So you know that the vaccines themselves are quite complex. Uh, they are biological products. Um, you can't avoid it. You have inherent variability in the, in the materials, but also in the way the vaccines are produced. There are actually the newer technologies that have the advantage of having uh, more, let's say, uh, certainty in the, um, you know, removing all the unknowns or the variables. So, you know, the recombinant uh, protein uh, is one, uh, you know, the um, subunit flu, let's say, I mean, there you have also uh, less variability. So, you know, the shift to new technologies 
is not self-serving. It's also to, uh, to deliver a better vaccine, but also to be able to uh, produce it much, uh, much more effectively with less risk of uh, negative impact. Uh, the manufacturing is complex. You have seen that. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, complicated steps, a lot of QCs. Uh, you have, uh, yeah, this is actually quite cool. So you have multiple manufacturing sites that are involved in production of one product. So if you have a conjugate vaccine, as I said, it might be that you're producing your polysaccharide on one site in one country. Uh, you have your carrier protein from another country. You do the conjugation in a third country, and then you ship it to another country to the, to the filling. So it's actually the vaccine might go around the world maybe three times before it actually ends up in the vial. Uh, regulatory requirements are complex, so we have hundreds of quality control tests. It's, it looks like a Bible. I mean, it's a really thick uh, dossier that goes with each batch. It's a very tight quality control. A significant, um, a significant amount of time is spent on that, as you have seen. And the tests are performed by the manufacturer, exporting country, and the importing country. So the regulatory is very heavy on vaccines. Um, so there, you know, all these elements put together, they are actually, uh, you know, creating the process quite uh, sensitive to um, uh, disruptions. I mean, if you basically miss one step in the quality control out of the hundreds, that's it for the batch. You start new uh, batch typically. If you have, uh, you know, shortage supply of your raw material, you know, that is a problem because, you, you know, all the rest is ongoing and this one part is missing. I mean, the, you know, the whole process is stopped. Uh, if you have, um, you know, an outbreak somewhere, you know, you can't just like immediately ramp up the production because you start, the, I mean, it takes two years to make the vaccine. So there are some inbuilt mechanisms where you might have a buffer stock of the intermediate product that you might use for uh, this increased need, the short notice need, but it is not something that you could do a lot, you know, then you still, you still have to make it up later. It's really for the most acute cases and in many vaccines it's just not possible. Um, so an example is pertussis containing vaccines. So this is something that is, I think, a lot in, the, uh, in some of the media. <coughs> You might have seen that maybe. Uh, so the, the vaccines that are containing uh, acyl or pertussis antigen, they, have, they are actually in a very tight supply constraint since about one year. And we can, I, it's actually a perfect example of what I was just talking about. So how did it happen? So on one hand, you have an incre increased demand uh, that is based, by, based on the evolution of immunization programs. So the countries are actually switching from the whole cell pertussis to the acellular formulation. Also, you had the pertussis outbreaks in the United States and in the uh, UK. So the authorities have decided to revaccinate part of the population. At the same time, you have countries that are in, in introducing the booster doses in their national immunization programs. So that's an extra doses that you actually have to deliver. And finally, there is the uh, maternal immunization that is now being more recognized and as effective way to actually prevent against pertussis. So some, some countries implement pertussis vaccination in maternal immunization. So that's about 21 countries in the world now, including UK actually. Uh, so at the same time, on the other hand, you have the supply constraints. So you know it takes two years to produce actually such a vaccine. So you can't immediately just ramp up the production. Uh, I mean, first of all, you would have to have the extra capacity, uh, which you might not have, actually. Uh, actually, you know, you saw that 70% of the time, you actually have to go through the QC tests. Uh, you have to comply, so you're assuming that 100% of your production will actually pass all those tests. Uh, you have this in vivo uh, testing, which is another vari uh, variability uh, uh, factor. And there are only two manufacturers that are actually producing this vaccine globally. So if one of those two actually has a problem, the other one has a problem as well, because it's, it's a very tight uh, supply uh, environment. It's really funny, if you actually saw a paper, for, I think it was published in like early 90s, uh, there was a paper by Milstein, I believe, and it was actually describing the global overproduction of pertussis vaccines. So I, I think we dealt with that quite well. 
Uh, so, you know, it was basically at the time he was talking about regional unused capacity for pertussis vaccines that were there but not used due to the fragmented uh, regulatory requirements where you couldn't produce easily uh, vaccine in one country and use it in another. So you would have actually these capacities that you could use for something else. You know, and you see that this was, what, 20, 30 years ago? And so since then, the, the situation has dramatically evolved. Uh, you know, you have always these new companies that are developing new vaccines that you expect will appear on the market in 10 years or five years. You don't know if it happens. And when you actually plan your uh, production capacity, you have to take that somehow uh, into account as well. So the vaccine supply and demand is a balancing act. It's actually a big part of the vaccine production. Uh, when you think about the, the quantities you're producing, you have to really think far ahead. You have to be sure that this vaccine will actually be needed and you might, you might not be blocking your capacity to produce other vaccine that might be needed even more. And um, uh, the capacities actually to produce the vaccines, they are uh, quite, uh, they take a long time to actually build and require significant investments. So it's not something that you would decide overnight, obviously, to do. Uh, so to build a new manufacturing capacity takes about eight to 10 years. And obviously, I'm not talking about the building itself, but it's the putting in place uh, the processes, validating it. You know, you saw how complex it is. You have to be sure that you're getting it right, uh, you know, to pass through the QC and you adhere to the good manufacturing processes. So you really have to think a decade ahead. And it's a huge investment. So it's upward of $600 million to build a new factory. So for a company, this is something that actually is a, is a, a significant strategic decision to build a new manufacturing facility. And it's something that should be needed actually for another couple of decades you know, to make somehow sense in the, in the global planning of the company. So just to give you uh, a flavor of uh, how you put together the vaccine development and vaccine supply, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, sh uh, chosen this slide where you have the whole vaccine development from the very beginning, from the research and development and the preclinical testing uh, until the actual uh, vaccine production. So you see that at the very beginning you have the research, you look for your antigens, uh, which you found, luckily, you have your preclinical development, which might take anywhere between a uh, couple to couple decades, a couple of years to a couple of decades, and it already will cost a couple <laughs> millions of dollars, usually, before you even get to the clinical development. And then after you get to the clinical development, you start with your phase one, phase two. So phase two, this is the proof of concept. Based on that, you decide if you go into your phase three, which is really the registration trial. And after phase three, you have your filings with the regulatory agency, and then you have the uh, <coughs> registration and the post-marketing. So now, if you go back and you think how long it takes to build a facility, it, you know, eight to 10 years. So you can't really wait until the end of the clinical development to build the facility. If you really want to be able to supply the vaccine at the time you have your marketing approval, you have to be much smarter and you have to really think ahead. And you have to make your decision roughly midway in the clinical development. So at the time of proof of concept, you, so before you have the final package of the phase three trials and you know if the vaccine really, really works and it's really safe and the regulatory people were happy with that, at the phase two, end of phase two typically, you have to make the decision to start building a factory for the vaccine manufacturing. So it takes uh, a lot of courage <laughs> and it takes uh, some vision and maybe even some clairvoyance because uh, you are building at risk. So it's, a, it's an investment that you, are, you will end up having an empty factory that will uh, not serve anything, maybe. So this is, this is somehow uh, you know, showing how, how complex it is, you know, vaccine supply, uh, is something that is, uh, in a, in, it's a long-term thinking. It's not something that you just, you know, do from one year to another. And so the problems, you know, with the vaccine supply we have today, I think they need to be addressed in a, in a systemic way. So it's not 
I think it's not just the vaccine suppliers that should be, uh, you know, meeting the needs which they can't uh, in a way that, you know, would be, you know, very flexible actually because of the inherent nature of the process. But I think it needs to be more of a, a two-side dialogue. So the, the vaccine supplier companies should be probably much closer to those entities that plan uh, the implementation of the vaccines. So uh, to be able, um, you know, to, so first of all, we should really understand that the, the vaccine supply takes a long time uh, to put into place and then even to manufacture. And also that, uh, you know, the, the vaccine supply is not the end of the story. The company still needs to exist after. So it actually needs to be sustainable. So you have to have a vaccine production that is actually uh, um, allowing further investments in vaccine development. And uh, then you have to actually liaise with those entities that decide on the implementation of the vaccines. So you have to, uh, you have to really go in the direction of the long-term uh, demand forecasting. So to understand how will your national immunization program evolve in the next 10 years, let's say. So what should we prepare for to make sure that you are successful in your immunization program uh, implementation? Uh, reduction of complexity. Uh, some immunization programs are better than others. Uh, you can uh, probably, uh, you know, within, even within Europe, uh, which is fairly uh, homogeneous, well, some places more than others, but, uh, you know, not so far apart uh, region, uh, there are huge differences in the immunization programs. I mean, those schedules are really made up locally and uh, they, they keep on changing as well. So this also implies differences in uh, the demand for the vaccine. The horizon scanning, long-term planning. So this is something, again, that is a little bit more strategic, uh, where the, the, the manufacturers should probably be more part of the discussion with the health authorities uh, to actually help also prepare for bio threats, let's say, you know, to, to identify what are the future interests in the country. You know, where would you like to go next? What are your concerns? I mean, this will also help inform the vaccine development a little bit better. And then the fair pricing and market conditions. So this is a big topic with vaccines. I mean, vaccines should be available to everybody. I mean, it's, it's almost like access to clean drinking water. I mean, you would expect to have, you know, the vaccine against a deadly disease available for a child today. So it needs to be at the price that is right for the given market. And you know that those conditions are really variable. Uh, you know, you will have uh, you know, the poor developing countries that need help, you will have the rich Western countries, you will have some middle income countries. And so it's a question of getting the price right to, to, to match the market. So actually our company has been one of the first ones to introduce tier pricing, where we make the vaccine available to everybody by reducing the prices uh, as low as possible for the developing countries and keeping the prices at the, at the Western level in the Western countries. And so in this, in this process where you combine the volume and, and the price uh, in, the, in the whole global picture, you will be able still to, to ensure that you have a sustainable business and you're able to invest in future uh, uh, development. And so this is the end of the presentation. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>